I just want to give you a small giveaway. It's not about the environment. So it's not a talk about how the Port of Rotterdam has found a solution to get rid of all the emissions or fumes or environmental uh, dangers that are within the harbor. That's not what this talk is about. So if you were expecting that one, you can still leave. Not everybody's still sitting, so I'll just introduce myself for, for a little bit. Uh, I'm Peter van der Meer. Uh, I'm a Dutchie. Uh, I, I'm working as a data engineer at the Port of Rotterdam. I'm consulting there, actually, so I'm not an employee of the Port of Rotterdam. I'm a sailor, so I really love to work at the Port of Rotterdam because they're doing stuff with boats. And I like, like to be on the water. And every once in a while, we get a free trip with a boat through the harbor to look at stuff that we think is very cool mainly based on engineering stuff, but still, I, I like it. I'm a daddy as well, but looking at, looking at myself at my age, I think that everybody could have expected that one. Okay, the Port of Rotterdam. Uh, who knows where the Port of Rotterdam is? Uh, quite a few. Uh, I see a few Dutchies. They, they know where it is. Um, did you know that the Port of Rotterdam is the largest port of Europe? by far. If you go worldwide, we can into another discussion. All the harbors that are within Asia, you cut the harbors in Asia, they're somewhere up there, and then we cut the harbors in Europe and Americas. And that's somewhere down there. Because everything that we build and buy, like phones and computers, it all comes from, from Asia, so they got really, really large harbors. But still, we're the largest in Europe. If you look at worldwide, depending on what kind of data you look at, there are somewhere between 9 and 12. That has to do if you take into account dry bulk or just containers. and They're all using d different numbers. There's 77 kilometers of uh, K wall, or, and, and a, a, a K wall is where you can dock a boat. So we can store 77 kilometers of boat at any given time. There are 80 terminals, terminals, and that's where stuff can, can be put onto a ship or taken off a ship. And we're uh, processing 461 million tons of bulk, which is a lot. And 7.4 million containers. And for some reason, because if you see a container on a truck on the road, there's always those big ones, right? They're always 40 feet. But if you want to talk numbers with other harbors, they're using 20 feet containers. I don't, still don't understand why that is. There are nine power plants at, at the site, so uh, there's quite a few uh, uh, chemical industries are in the area, and they need a lot of power. 3,000 companies, and that can go from companies that actually take stuff off the ship, but also all kinds of supporting companies in the sense that the people that live on the ship, they need food as well. So it's just a big grocery store that can bring stuff to the ships. 175,000 jobs, which is, gives the Port of Rotterdam top five biggest employers in, in the Netherlands. And it's very good for our economy, the Dutch economy, 21 billion euros. If I look at the environment that we're going to look at, we're looking at ships, ships that are within the harbor and that, that are visiting the, the area. Concurrently, there are between 1,200 and 1,700 ships each moment in the harbor. It depends a little bit on, on the time of day, how, mu how much it is. But if it, during the day, it's between 16 and 1,700 ships a day. 30,000 30, of those ships that are uh, there, they actually dock and load uh, or unload uh, cargo. And all those ships are tracked by radar and AIS. We, ca we use two signals. I'll get on onto that one later. <laughs> and if you think, OK, uh, well, what is the relation to, to th those ships and, and their, their movements within the harbor and, and the environment? For example, if you look at uh, cars, they currently produce, give or take, 20, 28 kilotons of CO2 a year. And I did that last year. If you look at the ships that are in the harbor, they're doing 32 
kilotons. So if we want to save the environment, we should actually uh, revitalize the, the, the shippings to use clean fuel, which is getting there. But we were given a few challenges, because we're doing nothing new, because they already process, were processing the data, but we, they did it in an old-fashioned way. You had a MapReduce system with, map, uh, with uh, Hadoop, and the data was delivered every 10 second, seconds by means of an F FTP transfer. And that data was collected for a month, and then they run the map produced up, which was by hand. And then all of a sudden, we had a few numbers. Nine out of 10 times, we had to fix the data to get the right numbers, because they had a feeling about that one. So, OK, they, w they started replacing the system. But that had its, had, had its challenges as well, because we're doing 450 unique messages each second. And a, a message is an event from a ship within the area that we're scanning. The data is from both radar and AS, as I uh, mentioned before. But there's a problem with radar and, a and especially AS data. It's jitterish. If you take your phone and you walk outside and I want to go to the big man, and you look at your phone and you're like, I'm not there. Why does it think I'm all the way across the street? It's sort of OK, and especially if you've, uh, you have a phone, Android or an iPhone. They also use uh, all kinds of Wi-Fi networks. The signals they pick up to pinpoint your location to, to get a good position, but you're sort of there. They want all the data. So uh, uh, four days, days downtime in a single year, well, that's about the limit, because they use it for uh, accident replays, they use it as well. If some ships collide, the insurers come to you, oh, what happened between those ships? And then we have to provide the, all the data that we have on how the ships have moved within the harbor. <coughs> yeah, we had the existing system and the existing software, which was quite complex and, and quite a few pro processes on it. We could not change that, at least not very quickly. And the other one, store all the data for five years. So later on in the presentation, I'll be giving you a few numbers on, on, on that part. And they want to have that everything, preferably real time. So they want to have a look um, on, for example, how much CO2 is expelled in area X real time. But before I go on, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about ship positions, because that's, that's, that's key to the story. And ship positions, it sounds easy. We've got a boat, we've got a transmitter on it, we've got a radar, it's over there. Sort of. AES is, that, is a system that every commercial ship needs to have on its boat. And it's nothing more than a uh, a GPS receiver and a transponder that sends the position based on GPS back to a base station. And that signal is sent between three and uh, three seconds and, to be correct, six minutes. Depends on the speed and, and all kinds of variations on that one. It's okay, cool. There's one problem with it. If you have, to have that one in a ship, I turn it off, and we're looking, where did you go? Therefore, we're using radar as well. Radar is just, uh, anybody knows from, from history what or how radar works? It's, it's not actually nothing more than a microwave that's being sent, and the echo is, uh, is processed to pinpoint where the, the system was, just like bats do. Sorry. If you look at the port of Rotterdam, all those dots that you see here are radar positions. So we have quite a few. Uh, the, depending on, on how 
Uh, like, like here, there, there are quite a few next, next to each other that all has to do with all kinds of buildings that might be in the way so that we don't have a good look on where a ship might be. Oh, I'm missing a slide. Oh, okay. That, that I have a few pictures of, of, of a, uh, a big ra uh, radar tower which is at the uh, entrance of the port of Rotterdam, which is 70 meters high. So it has a quite a big range on the North Sea and into the inland. And depending on where you are, uh, some of these positions also have a, uh, 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 say again, an AS tra uh, transceiver to pick out the signals that we have. That one. If you look at a mapping, uh, this is uh, something just uh, t taken from marine traffic. These are all the ships that are within the harbor of Rotterdam, based on AES signals. And if you, uh, you can see that, uh, for example, on, on, the, on the right, uh, sorry, your left side, that's the mass flag, which is where the big ships are. And when you go uh, more towards the city and the inlands, the boats get smaller and smaller. But you see there are a lot more here than over there. All has to do with the size of the ships. If you click on a specific boat, we, this is where we work. It's in the center of uh, Rotterdam. And there's a, a ship docked just across the water for us. And you can get all kinds of information. Uh, this is just a sailboat, sorry, I love sailboats. I haven't even, I have not sailed on that one, but I know the ship. Uh, and that was parked at, in the center of Rotterdam. So you can see uh, it's, it's currently, it's moored, uh, it has no speed, and its drag is two and a half meters. Okay. But what about GPS? This is what I explained earlier. Uh, GPS is a signal that's sort of okay. And how accurate it is, and the spoiler is, it depends where you are. If you're in open sky, it can be accurate on five meters, five meters, and that's what the specification about what AES says can provide you. But you have to be in an open area. If you're on the ocean, it's five meters. But if you're in an urban area like a city or anywhere else, it can be up to a hundred meters. And why, 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 why does that happen? The satellite sends a, uh, transmits a, a continuous signal with, with a certain pattern in it, and you can use that to position your, to calculate the distance from the satellites towards yourself. You need at least three of them, and then you can actually really pinpoint your position. But when there are buildings around you, they bounce off. And this person thinks that the satellite is over there. How come? Then so he positions you over here somewhere. Good part is, if you look at the speed from a, uh, if, if you have GPS, uh, it's, people are always trying to hit the speeding limit on, uh, within your car. If you have a good GPS receiver on that one, you can use that one to stay within the speed limit because it's from 0, 0, 006 meters a second precise. And you might ask, why is that difference so great? In position, you're like, yeah, sure, sort of, but speed is accurate. They're using a different technique, which is called the Doppler effect. You probably know that when a uh, police car crosses you, the sound changes. They use the same technique to determine how far away you are from the satellite. Because the signal stretches, and if you have three of them, you can do very precise calculations based on that one. But it dep all depends on which kind of GPS receiver you have. Because it's, it's, it's a formula and that has to be cal calculated. So if you have a very cheap one, it's probably not 0, 0, 006 meters, maybe a half a meter, but it depends.
Okay, so what, what did we build? Uh, if you... Uh, yes, it should work. Where are you? No, you're not working. At the left side, we have our source systems. Um, those are two systems that continuously produce 450 messages a second. But to get our uptime and, and accuracy, we do that two times. Only problem is when we have that one, we get duplicates from different servers. So we have to deduplicate those to get rid of the message that we already seen. To support the uh, existing system, we just write uh, convert that signal to a CSV file that can that works with the Hadoop system and the MapReduce jobs we have. We build tracks from it to keep all get all the points together. We store that one to uh, some data as well, and then the real fun begins, and in, in getting real interesting numbers. And the one I'm going to show you later on is something uh, related to emissions. So actually, the environment is somewhere in this story. But we're still, we know there are a lot more processes in that one. Uh, they also want to know what's the occupancy of a certain area within the harbor. <coughs> Sorry. Okay. The first part is the uh, consuming part. We process uh, 77 million, almost 78 million messages in a single day, which is fairly okay. It's, I wouldn't say it's big, big data, but it's, it's fairly fast. But if you look at the data, it's, it's 62 gigs a day that we ingest and that we need to store. I, don't depict, uh, I haven't depicted here, but all the data that is coming in from either server, we store that one as well. Just to be on the safe side, if something goes wrong within the process uh, further on, we can rerun the entire process. So we got two distinct sources, two servers that provide us the data. We implemented it in Colang because it, it was a it's, it's a fairly simple process. Just connect to it, make a TCP connection, you get XML and put it on, on a Kafka topic. That's all that it does. One thing that it also does is it generates a key that we use later on in the process to make sure that we can differentiate between the two servers and if those messages are unique. That also, and that's just based on a, a certain fields that are within the message. And when it's done, it just puts it on, on, uh, on Kafka, uses the key, with the, the hash key, uh, as the key within Kafka, so we can later on proce process it. Okay, so that was the first one. The deduplication, uh, we call it the deduplicator. Uh, somebody came up with a word and we were just using that one. So what I said, both servers send their data and they're all, they're, they're duplicated, they're, uh, but we use keys from a hash to say, okay, th th this message, hmm, I've already seen that. So what we actually do, we just take the key out, the message, store it, and send the initial message with that key, we forward that one to, to, to the next topic. And if you've already seen that hash key, we just drop the message. <coughs> it's doing a thousand messages a second, give or take. So yeah, we, have to, we needed to do some tuning on, on that part to, to get it running easily. It has to be restartable. Uh, if, if the crash is, uh, we still need to know, okay, did I see that message already? Or we missed two hours, uh, we can get the data from somewhere else. And the implementation is actually nothing more than a Kafka consumer with a transformer in it. And we're using a, uh, a Kafka state store to <laughs> Uh, keep the the keys at hand. Excuse me. So you keep, you trust only the keys which are the same from the same sources? Yes. And so the and what you do with uh, the ones which are different? Um, when a uh, uh, two identical because the, the data the service provides identical data because the, the, they have one source 
which is a radar AF mixed signal. And those values we use to generate the key. So if a ship is uh, detected by radar AS, we get a, a speed, a position, and some other fields. And that is being sent it's, or duplicated in two different processing pipelines from that environment. And we connect to both those endpoints. But we know the, 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 some key values that are in there, so position and update time and, and stuff like that. We know they're uh, the same for the same event. So one radar event will result in two messages from both servers, but the data contained therein, based, uh, excluding some fields, is the same. And we generate a hash key on that one. So we know that if the hash key is the same, the data is the same. So the, uh, what is the difference between the two signals? There's none. You have, uh, um, I'm, inter I'm more interested in how the, um, so there are two uh, receivers of the signal? Or? No, just one. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a combination of quite a few. Because uh, uh, a, a, uh, a ship that has an AS, AS uh, transmitter, that signal is being received by multiple uh, base stations. Same as the position that is being reported by radar, it's probably reported by two or three radar stations at the same time. And the entire system processes that, makes a single image of it, and then because of reliability, it's duplicated. We have two systems. So they, because those guys that uh, depend on it, uh, harbor marshals and, and people like that, they really need 24-7 data. So that's why it's duplicated in, in the environment. Yeah. <coughs> okay, but if we go back to the... Um, yeah, I'm here. Uh, the implementation of the deduplication process uh, is actually quite simple. We create a state store, which is just a, a key value byte store, N nothing more, nothing to it. Uh, we say, okay, uh, what is it, 100,000 elements in it, that should be enough, because an event will probably not be repeated uh, a lot of times, and if we got 100,000 in it and we're doing 1,000 messages a second, we're safe. We're, we're not going to lose messages that are being late. We add that uh, state store to, to the stream, and we just do the uh, tra transformation, the, the, uh, the Kafka tra transformer, and the Kafka transformer does nothing more than when the message get it gets in there, it goes to the state or, oh yeah, it's already there, drop the message. And that's the fun, uh, one of the nice things about the uh, transformer, if you return, return null, the event is dropped. So it's not being emitted by the stream. So the, um, where is that one here? This line, the two, to the target topic, when we drop the message in the transformer, nothing happens there. So we act effectively dropped the message. This is the first component we writ we've written for the entire system. Because we get a new data feed in, we store that one, and then we said, oh, we have to support the original systems. Oh, they use a CSV format. Well, we can transform the input format we have now, which is a XML-based uh, part, or JSON, actually. And we can convert, convert that to CSV quite easily. So we just take the meshes, make it CSV, put it on HDFS, and the existing systems are happy. And we were happy as well, so that gave us all the time to start working on, on the, the other parts of the system. Building tracks. The systems that follow the, the, the ships, all of a sudden they lose them and they give them an, an, a different track ID. We don't know, still don't know why they lose it that much, but they lose it. And we want to reference to a ship as long with a unique number, as long as it's been in the harbor. So it comes in on Wednesday, goes into the Maasvlakte, 
it uh, dumps its load to, I don't know, wh wh whichever party it takes an, in a new load and it leaves. We want to have that visit under a single ID because that makes it easier to do analysis later on in the process for, uh, for the scientists. So we want, for example, the ship code comes from, all the, from that way all the way to here, and this is give or take the boundary that we can track. So we, we want to do that, but it proves a lot more difficult than we thought. We said, okay, we've got a, a unique identification for that ship. We just connect those dots, and if there's some event where we don't have that number, yeah, we probably have that RF field, and we can stick that together. Yeah, not really, because we we're the, the source system changed IDs a lot faster than we thought, and then that proved to be quite difficult. So we implemented an, an arc, uh, algorithm that uses, for example, the MMSI number, which is the, a unique identifier for a ship, to, to connect all the dots. And the tracks that we can build now are fairly precise. We still have some flukes in it, because sometimes it happens, oh, the ship is here, it's moving here, it's moving it's over there, and um, then it's there. We're still looking into that one, why that one happens. But we're quite convinced that it's within the source of the data, but we're still looking into it. There's also a thing that we call optimal filtering, or cleaning up the data, because what I said, GPS is sort of OK. So the signal, uh, if, you, if you look at the previous picture, that was a nice straight line. Nah. It was hard, very hard. Because we saw these kind of images on the tracks. That boat there, it's not moving. It's sitting still, it's, it's moored with ropes and stuff. It's not moving at all. But the signal says it is all the time. And that's AES. Radar a little bit as well, but it's moving all the time. If you go to the image all the way on the left, what's it doing here on land? I think it's quite difficult to, to take a boat of give or take uh, 500 tons lift it up, put it on the dock, and five minutes later, oh, yeah, just put it back. That, that, that won't work. But it's a real issue, because we want nice, clean tracks, because we calculate all kinds of information based on, upon that one. And this ship is parked. When a ship is parked, its, its emissions are quite low, because it turns off quite, quite a few engines. No, still running. At least that's what we can get from the data. So we, we're working on, on getting that, that stuff out. Another cool thing, and uh, those, these give all very nice pictures. Sometimes the signal says we're moving. But we also, okay, defense, I'm still there. You, you get these nice parasols of, of data. And yeah. It's a work in progress. We're still struggling to, to get all the, all the anomalies out of, out of the positions. It's a work in progress. So we, we work closely with uh, our data, internal data scientists that, that have uh, a better feeling and, and longer knowledge on how ships move and, and how the data is composed. We're using a few different approaches. Uh, Kalman, which is one of the I would say de facto standards on, on filtering uh, GPS signals. It's just, it's, it's an algorithm that can cope with an unknown error and tries to smooth that one out. But that, that doesn't solve it, because that ship that was, wasn't moving, from the GPS we, c we get a speed of zero. But I'm here, I'm not moving. How can I calculate what the next position could be? We cannot do that well, Kalman. So we're trying to use uh, classifiers, uh, physical probability. Uh, if we, uh, uh, for example, a ship is moving with, uh, with four knots 
and we get the next signal three seconds later, and it has moved 15 kilometers? <coughs> Probably not. And, it, and when, you, when we find a ship that can really do it, I'm, I'm going to buy it. Because I can get to the, to the UK in 15 minutes by boat. And I can pr probably make quite a lot of money on it. And we're trying to do some filtering stuff, but we're still working on that with, with scientists. And like I said, once we've done that, we kind of store it again. Because then we have a nice, clean signal for each ship with a nice path, and that one we can use to do all kinds of uh, processing on. But it's quite a bit. They want to store that for five years. Um, we're doing give or take 62 gigabytes a day. It, it's not used, uh, I see uh, some, uh, at least a shirt from Amazon, I don't know if you work for Amazon. 62 gigs a day for you guys, it's nothing. But when I look at the port of Rotterdam, for them it's an issue, because they're not used to those fast amounts of data. Initially, we, we used uh, Kafka Connect to save all the events. Mm, it's not really working, but that has not, I don't think it has to do with uh, Kafka Connect, but the environment that we're working in. An initial thought was, hmm, it's a time series, we can store that in, in React. But then we, later on, we figured out, yeah, but we don't have actual physical servers. And I don't know if anybody ever tried to run React on a Kubernetes cluster. Don't try it, because it won't work. And we tried. And now we get to the cool part, emissions. Because that one is about the environment. Port of Rotterdam is a big harbor, and pollution is a big issue. So they want to control that one and measure that and give ships a fine if they produce too much emissions. But we need to calculate that one, being sure that we do it correctly. So they want to do that real time. And they want to have all kinds of components that ships do uh, emit, calculate it. Uh, the, the nitrogen and oxygens, uh, which are commonly, usually not mentioned in all kinds of environment things. Yeah, yeah, we need to reduce CO2. Yeah, but we got NO and NO2 as well. Now, carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide, everybody knows that one. Everybody's talking about it, but we got sulfur, methane, methane, and hydrocarbons and aerosols. Anybody know what aerosols are? those little dusty things that are within the air, and that's why diesels are not allowed within, in, in cities. Or at least one of the main reasons why, why it's not allowed. But how do you calculate the emission of a ship? I don't know what's in there. I just know it's moving somewhere on the North Sea and it's traveling with seven knots. Port of Rotterdam went to TNO, which is a uh, the, the applied science research, a, a government. Uh, well, it's government. I'm not sure. Partly government, but they're non-biased in, in the sense that they just look at the facts. They classified all the boats that are visiting the port of Rotterdam, which is quite a few, and they they, they created a, a model that depends on the speed, the location, and its activity. Just like I said in one of the earlier pictures, when the boat is docked, it turns off quite a few engines. So its emissions will be a lot lower. It, it's time-based, so we use uh, the, 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 the time between two points or where the ship was to, to, to calculate that one. And again, it's just a, ca a Kafka with a, a state store and a transformer, because we need to previous position, current position, and how much is emitted within those two. And we try, uh, we're looking into storing the results in uh, Azure Cosmos, but I'll get back to that one later on. This is how we do it. Easy, right? We just take the speed, because give or take everything is a lookup, and we only use the speed. 
and the time, those are the varying factors to, for us to calculate the uh, emissions. Don't make pictures of that for me. So I could get into trouble. <coughs> for example, we have a, uh, quite a big boat. That's the Old Salami. It's a crude oil, oil tanker that visits Port of Rotterdam every now and now and then. It's a big one, 332 meters. So if you want to walk from that one point to that one, it will take you five to ten minutes just to get there. It's 60 meters wide, so it will take two to three times this room in, in width. Sorry? I thought I heard a question. It was built in 2011, so it's, it's a fairly new ship. But Tino provides us with a table like this. There are a few X's in it because I'm not allowed to show those numbers. But what it says is that it has a, a number, the, first, the second line is the MSG number, that's the identification for that ship. Uh, when we, uh, the, this model was calculated, uh, some HBR, Port of Rotterdam specific stuff. And then the ME uh, kilowatt used is the power that the engine has when it's running. And if we want to calculate a, a certain uh, emission, we just look up, okay, we're looking for the main engine, we're looking uh, at nitrogen, nitrogen oxide, and we take the number from the table, combine that with the speed and the the distance, and we're done. And now I have a small demo. I hope it's, uh, it's always tricky when you do a demo. When we run that, because I, I, I collected some data, because I cannot show you, show you the data real time, because it's still a little bit too much to, to over do over connection here. This is a picture that is uh, sulfur dioxide emissions from Three hours, a period of three hours. If you look at it, and you, you, uh, the, the ship here in the middle, it's a big boat. And it's parked there and it's probably dropping its cargo to a certain uh, depot. And you see all the, the blue colors, there's a little bit green, and that has to do that is one of the congestion areas where ships come together to, to get into the canal. If we go more into the city center, and we zoom in, oh, I hope I was on the right spot. If I zoom in a little, no, I was not in the right spot. Of course, I'm not in the right spot. Hmm, cool. Always with live demos, right? I'll pinpoint you to do something else, else that's uh, quite funny to see. Because we didn't expect to see this one. We can actually see the shipping lanes at the exit of the Port of Rotterdam by just calculating the emissions. You see, uh, uh, you see this line here? It's, it's, it's a boat that's going to probably Hamburg or so, uh, somewhere like that. The other ones that are more to, uh, towards the side, they probably go to the UK. And the ones that go down go to France, Spain, or wherever they want, want to be. But what you also see, and I hope my zoom in now works. It's too bad, it doesn't really work. I don't know why it's giving me this error, but in this area, if, if, if it's working, you see a big red dot coming up as well. And we looked that up on the map. Why is, it, why is that? big red dot there. Well, that's the parking zone, parking area. Because uh, for a ship, it's very expensive to, to spend time in the harbor. And if they have to wait to, to get their cargo out or drop off their cargo, you're just going to wait on, uh, on, on the sea. And you just put in the anchor and, and come, come to wait for that one. OK. So we've got all this up and running. Uh, we're more still in, in quite a, a demo phase, uh, experimental phase. Um, due to all kinds of changes within the team, uh, we started out using Scala. 
but we cut a between quotes a few newbie, newbies and our Scala code that we had they were like what's that and how should I read that they were quite more proficient in, in, in Java and and therefore Kotlin uh, I was like no, I'm not going back to Java because I'm used to Scala so do something in the middle so we go for Kotlin so we're moving more and more towards Kotlin some go because that's some of, of my colleagues, he's like, oh, can I do that? No. And then he asked, why not? You're going to do it in Go. And a lot of the rest of the team doesn't really, uh, cannot really read Go language, Go, Go lang, so we try to keep him away from writing code for us. <coughs> We're using Spring Boot with Actuator to, to get st statistics. We're moving towards Azure and Event Hubs. And we're going to drop Kafka. I see somebody looking, oh, why are you dropping Kafka? No reason. The reason is that our current uh, infrastructure provider cannot cope with the requirements we have on I.O. and everything else. And because we're working for a semi governmental organization, the choice of cloud solution is Microsoft. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to Microsoft, that has event apps, why should I deploy Kafka there and maintain all that stuff? And we're going to store the, the, the data within uh, Cosmos. What are you going to replace Kafka with? Uh, event hubs. What? Event hubs. Event hubs is uh, the, 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 the message broker from uh, Microsoft, from Azure. And it has an interface that you can act like it's Kafka. I haven't really experimented with it yet, but when I look at the documentation, it's like, hmm, I can just drop my code there and it should work. So, but partitioning in, in uh, event hubs is it's going to be tricky. We, we're going to run into a few challenges there, I think. But the lessons that we learned on, on, in this entire project is that do not use Kubernetes for persistent storage. Because we were stuck with a certain provider that only provided us with Kubernetes, and we we're like, yeah, we're going to store that one. It's not working. You get an I.O. bone like somewhere. Because uh, uh, there we're using uh, cluster and cluster to, to, to store the data, and we're stuffing too much data over the line, and all of a sudden Kafka says, oh, oh, oh hang on, hang on. I'm, I, I've lost the end of my file. And we're like, yeah, but you just wrote to it. So it gets all kinds of delays in that. Soaring 62 gigabytes a day, it's a challenge. It's not a big one, but you really have to look into uh, storing 62 gigabytes a day. If you want to see what's going on in a system that, that's moving data quite fast, you need metrics. You need dashboards to, to see stuff. And my personal opinion, do not use Afro. It's slow. Because every time you have to, to, to uh, marshal or unmarshal a message, it has to go to the, uh, to the server to, to get the schema, and then it can marshal it. So it, it, it's, it's fairly slow. And when we're looking in our process, and we don't have to actually deserialize the message, we don't do it. We say, yeah, just, it's just bytes. Sure, whatever. We don't care. Well, for example, the deduplication, we don't even deserialize the, 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 the value of it. We just take the key and the bytes, yeah, sure. It's bytes. We don't want to kind of, kind of change that one. This is the end of my talk. I still have five, six minutes left. And it, yeah, I see a question in the back. Uh, on your uh, structure diagram, you specified the time delay or the duration of the steps. And there was a question mark with the uh, optimization cursor. So how long did that step take? Or is it a question mark? Yeah, um, the, the question is about the, 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 fil the, the filtering, and there are a few question marks in, in that part. We're still working on it. We, don't, we know the direction that we want to go to, and we, we, we did a few experience, experiments uh, with, with scientists, and it looks promising, but we're, we're, still, we're not there yet. We're not happy. With the, the, the information is not correct enough yet. But it's faster. It's Uh, in, in, uh, if the step is longer in the sense of processing time, 
No, not really. It, uh, we're doing 450 messages a second. We, we got multiple topics, we, so we can spread that one out. Uh, when we can keep that process between two events within five milliseconds, we're, we're happy. We've we got enough compute power to, to do that. I, saw an, I thought I saw another question. Any more questions? Why, uh, uh, the, the question is, why did, did, did we drop Kafka? Well, we haven't yet, uh, but uh, we're dropping Kafka because of the move towards Azure. And I don't want to maintain a Kafka environment by myself. No, not, not, not because of performance or anything. It's just uh, an ops thing. Uh, if I can get event hubs for free from, well, we're doing quotes for free from Azure, I'm just going to use it. I don't have to do anything on keeping keep that that running. If if they would have provided Kafka, I would have come come for Kafka. So there's no performance or any other reason to to drop Kafka. It's just because we moved to Azure and they have event hubs. Uh, uh, the question is, uh, did, did you uh, face any problems with Kafka streams within production? Yes and no. No in the sense that the things that we built work as, uh, as we expected it, uh, even in our test environment and our production environment. And I say yes <coughs> because um, the company that provides us uh, our infrastructure, they manage our Kafka environment and they're using Kerberos with all kinds of rules and uh, authorizations and stuff like that. So in that sense, yes, we had problems. Sure. But not on the, 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 the logic. And what's your data storage you use? Uh, I see that you use HDFS for uh, long-term storage and uh, for real-time processing. Yeah, the, the question is, uh, what are you using for, for, for storage? Um, we got a lot stored on HDFS, which is just the CSV and, and, and some other stuff that we store there. Uh, because we have our uh, challenges with our current uh, provider, that's the reason why we're going, moving towards Azure, and we just uh, our plan is to store everything in Cosmos. Okay. Um, because Cosmos, they promise us to grow indefinitely if we want to. And, that's, and quite, uh, uh, for performance on that one, no numbers yet. My assumption is that we'll make it there. You, you said uh, you tried to use React, but uh, it didn't run on Kubernetes. What do, did you use instead then? Um, uh, the question is, that, uh, you, we tried to use React uh, on, on Kubernetes. That doesn't work. And what are you using now? Currently, we're using uh, a small instance of uh, Elasticsearch. Okay. But that is just for us to progress within our system. So, and we just store, give or take, a week. We want to, wanted to store it indefinitely, but our uh, infrastructure provider cannot handle that amount of data. Or at least they, they feel challenged on that one. Um, you said there that you attempted to run React in Kubernetes, but couldn't. What was the problem you faced there? Um, the, uh, the, the question is, uh, why didn't you, uh, don't you run Kubernetes, uh, uh, React in, within Kubernetes, and, and what, what are the, uh, your challenges? Um, it all has, I, I think if we, we would have worked, kept on working on it, that we could get it running. But it's all based on, hey, you need to install Linux, and you have to have to do quite a few things, and it, it's quite picky on the storage. It didn't really run, it gave all kinds of errors. But probably when, uh, if you put more effort in into it, I think it's doable. But if you look on the internet and try to find somebody that did that one, I haven't found them. So if you know somebody who can, please let me know, because I'm interested. Um, uh, the question is, how much data do, do you need to retain on Kafka? Well, it's, it's our choice. Uh, we choose for a week. <laughs> So on all the topics that we have, we have a retention of, of one week. <coughs> I believe it's 
because it's compressed, it's, it's about uh, 100 kicks for each partition, each topic. Give or take. I could look it up for you if you want to, but I'm not, I don't have them in my head exactly. No more questions? And I see the red light here, so my time is up. Thank you. Don't forget to rate me.